Hi, this is Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation with Sheldon Richmond, the vice president of the foundation, and this is The Libertarian Angle, the show that's designed to bring you the libertarian angle on the burning issues of the day. So, Sheldon, you take the ball from here. Give me what your take is on the libertarian angle on what you want to talk about today. Well, there's things going on in those two forgotten places, for, forgotten as far as the American people are concerned, Afghanistan and Iraq. In Afghanistan, just the other day, 300 people uh, came to the capital, Kabul, to protest the presence in neighboring Wardak uh, province of special operations forces, U.S. special op ops, uh, working in conjunction with some kind of uh, rogue uh, militia in uh, grabbing people at night. People are disappearing. People are then bodies are turned up, beheaded. There's been torture. There's been all kinds of bad things. People have complained about it. They've complained to the U.S., got nowhere. They complained, uh, they went to Kabul to try to complain to U.S. officials and got nowhere. And then they complained to Hamid Karzai, who two weeks ago ordered the special ops out of that province. <clears throat> Except they're still there. They have not left and showing no signs of leaving. And so the people came to Kabul to do a public demonstration against the presence of these special ops uh, that are doing these, uh, at least in conjunction with Iraqi, uh, some kind of Iraqi uh, uh, squads, death squads, are engaged in some very nasty stuff. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting. The the government seems uh, the, the, of Afghanistan seems quite irritated with the U.S. because uh, their uh, their order that the that they leave the province has not been uh, honored, and uh, uh, a, a council of uh, of uh, sort of elders uh, from all over the country has issued a statement. Uh, condemning this and, and saying that if it, this doesn't stop very soon, they're going to regard the U.S. presence as an occupation, which kind of made me chuckle because it's been an occupation right from the start. But uh, interesting things uh, happening there, and uh, the question is, what is the Obama administration going to do? Here the people are asking or demanding that the U.S. troops get out, and they won't leave. Yeah, these disappearances kind of remind me of the old death squads and, and disappearances that were taking place in Latin America. And it's interesting that you, you now have some war crimes trials taking place, like the, the former president of Guatemala, a military general, is on trial right now for disappearances. And, and uh, of course, the U.S. was fully supporting him. They had, they had installed a succession of military generals there. And, and you've got... Uh, trials taking place in in Argentina right now under the military regime there. You've got the, the all the disappearances that took place in the Chile of Pinochet dictatorship, and all this was U.S. supported. And so now you have this this little death squad, disappearance squad taking place in in Afghanistan, where the people are in, that were in these homes where these people were taken are over there with signs and demonstrating, saying, "Look, just tell us what happened to our our our, our men that you've." taken away you know give us their names i mean get, show us what you did with them and and of course the u.s and and uh, the the little death squad that they were working with haven't provided any answers but to me you know here this is a classic example of creating enemies through u.s interventionism and and here a uh, uh, a president of a country that's supposed to be sovereign he's really just a crooked corrupt dictatorial puppet that the U.S. has installed, but he's saying, get out of this province, turn over Bagram um, a prison to us, and the U.S. just sits there and says, we'll do it on our own sweet time because we're in charge. I mean, is it any wonder why there is so much resistance to U.S. interventionism abroad, Sheldon? Well, there's not. There's no. It's not a wonder, and uh, the, the fact that this uh, reminds you of what, ha what happened in uh, in Latin America, when the U.S. Uh, under various administrations teamed up with with regimes and death squads and killed many, you know, were trained, you know, actively trained these people who and then supervised as they went out and killed people, uh, it should remind you. It should remind you of that because it is based on that model. In fact, it is known among American forces and policymakers as the El Salvador option. It happened in Iraq also, where the U.S. trained uh, Shiite. Uh, paramilitary type uh, forces, squads, and they, they went out and did some very, very nasty stuff against uh, Sunnis, including uh, torture in prisons, which the U.S. Uh, uh, by uh, decree stood on the, you know, stood aside and didn't uh, say, even say anything about. Uh, in, the, in other words, active, at least tacitly participated in this. 
And uh, that uh, had a lot to do with, uh, you know, quieting the violence, which is, uh, you, know, you know, McCain and people think it was such an important thing that happened from the surge. But much of that was the result of the U.S. aiding these militias that went out and uh, did some, you know, terrible things to people. Uh, and now it's happening in Afghanistan. So it, it is known as the El Salvador option. It's based on the model of what, what the Reagan administration was doing in El Salvador when they aided uh, these uh, death squads that went around and, uh, and killed all kinds of people. So, uh, yes, it, it, it looks like that because it is that. Yeah, and, and it's incredible to me that so many Americans just can't see the wrongfulness of this. They, they, they've convinced themselves that this is to protect our rights and our freedoms, when really none of these people over there are invading the United States. All the fight over there is over the, the, the authority of the U.S. government to continue intervening in these uh, countries' affairs, occupying their countries, invading them, sanctioning, embargoing. I mean, all these people that they're assassinating, they're not coming over here to invade the United States. The whole, all they're saying is, get out of our countries. They're, they're essentially saying what Karzai is saying with respect to that province. Get out of our countries. Get out of our regions. Leave us alone. And the U.S. government's taking the same position as that general and saying, we have the authority to be here. We're the U.S. government. We can continue doing these things. And so you've got this really what amounts to a perpetual war, Sheldon. I mean, this thing, I said it right after 9-11. I said this thing's going to go longer than the war on drugs because as long as they stay over there, they create the conditions for the people to get angry, retaliate against them, and then they somehow or another convince Americans that this is all for their, their freedom and their rights and their security and national security and that kind of nonsense. Well, you may be giving the American people a little too much credit. I'm not sure they even realize it's going on. So I, I'm not sure they say to themselves, I'm, I'm happy this is happening because you know we need this for our security. I think they've stopped paying attention to Afghanistan and Iraq a long time ago. And... Uh, I just don't think the average person realizes that the, that there's this uh, force in uh, in uh, you know Wardock Province that is uh, doing these bad things, and that the U.S. you know the troops were ordered out, and they won't, and the U.S. government won't remove them. I think if you went on the street and asked people if they knew anything about that, they they wouldn't they wouldn't know anything. So uh, if they knew about that, they may take the position you, that you're 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 saying that they believe it's for their safety. Well, we got to do it for our safety, but I don't even think they know that much. Uh, because no. foreign affairs has never been a high priority for the average person. It's obscure. The names are strange. It's far away. Uh, the drug war, they think, oh, that's our streets and our kids. But, uh, you know, I just don't think they're paying attention anymore. No, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm referring just to this mindless praise the troops. Praise the troops because and pray for the troops because they're defending our rights and freedoms. There's just this mindlessness of, of deference to authority when it comes to the what the federal government is doing overseas. Nobody gives it any thought. That You're right. They don't analyze. They don't think through it like we libertarians are doing. But I, I think in order to move this country into a better direction, we've got to start getting people to, to think to reflect, to, to raise their conscience, to raise their consciousness. Otherwise, we just continue on this perpetual path of war uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, war on terrorism, war on drugs, and so forth. You also mentioned Iraq. What did you have to say about Iraq? Well, yeah, just quickly on Iraq, uh, of course, most people think that the, the U.S. troops left at the end of uh, 2011 and that the war is over. Uh, as far as the U.S. is concerned, at least. Of course, if you do follow the papers, you see there's been a lot of violence. You have uh, Sunnis who are uh, uh, attacking Shiites. The majority of Shiites, uh, uh, you know, dominate the Sunnis, and uh, there's been uh, car bombings and suicide bombings lately. But now there was a story in the Wall Street Journal just, uh, I believe, last week about how the CIA is stepping up operations in Iraq, working with the, their uh, anti-terrorist uh, forces, and going after what they call al-Qaeda in Iraq, let's keep in mind that there was no al-Qaeda in Iraq before the U.S. Uh, invaded in, uh, you know, 2003. Uh, and so uh, now they are, they're active once again. They were active earlier, then, uh, then now they're active again. But the uh, very bizarre thing about all this is that these people that the CIA are going after into Iraq, those are the same people, we're, we're on the same side of those people in Syria. And we were on the same side of those, uh, of those people in Libya. 
In other words, we're, we were fighting with them. I'm not saying side by side and directly aiding them, but we were on the same side and aiding their cause, which was first to overthrow Gaddafi, which ended up arming a lot of them because when the arms caches opened up, they grabbed a lot of them. And uh, now we're on the same side fighting against a common enemy, Assad, in Syria. So this is even worse than Orwell. With Orwell, you had Eurasia. Sometimes Eurasia was our ally against East Asia. And then on a, you know, on a dime, it's suddenly our allies East Asia were fighting Eurasia. Those are at least different times. In this case, we're fighting alongside with Al Qaeda types and against Al Qaeda types at the same time in different places. So it's really hard to keep up. You really need your scorecard. Yeah, let's not ready. forget, let's not forget that, I mean, it was, uh, U.S. policy in Afghanistan, you know, sucking the Soviets into invading the country and then um, arming all the, uh, the the radical um, Muslims, including what would later become Al Qaeda, to resist the Soviet Union. And I mean, you've got yeah, all these. And, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, and then and, and, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was uh, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, uh, bragged some years later that uh, yeah, we did. We gave the, we gave the Soviets uh, their Vietnam by helping to draw them in. And uh, w this was before 9-11, this interview. It was with a French paper, and he was asked, well, you know, you, but we ended up arming a lot of, uh, you know, people that we may not like very much. And he said, yeah, but wasn't it worth it? We, we brought down the Soviet Union. Uh, now, it was before 9-11. I don't know if anyone's gone back to them, and, and, you know, not that I'm a fan of the Soviet Union. I'm, I'm happy to see the Soviet Union fall. It was falling anyway because of the internal contradictions of, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, communist economic system. Mises taught us that a long time ago. We didn't need to draw them into Afghanistan to do that. Uh, meanwhile, they killed a lot of people in Afghanistan thanks to our, quote, our, you know, quote, our drawing them in. But as a result, of course, like you say, a lot of uh, uh, Islamists, jihadists, were, were armed, and then uh, one of the turned on the U.S. next because they didn't want any foreigners. It wasn't wasn't that they didn't want Russians; they want foreigners. You, Americans don't seem to get that point. Yeah, I think Brzezinski, Brzezinski said something like, "What's uh, what's the problem with a few radical Muslims compared to giving the Soviet Union its Vietnam or something?" Well, yeah, you're right. I'm yeah. not sure he'd take that position after 9/11. It, it was no different. Well, he still ever see. He's still a respectable elder statesman who gets on television and gets, you know, gets interviewed every time he brings a book out. Nobody, oh, just, no, you know, when you're in when you're in that line of work, your reputation never gets tarnished, no matter what happens in the world. Well, no, because the mainstream media loves the national security state. They love all this empire stuff. They love deferring to the authority of the federal government in foreign affairs. So they're, they're going to treat these people as little mini gods. And you see that with Iraq. Because what's interesting is you've got the 10-year anniversary of the Iraq invasion. And uh, all the promoters of this disaster, which can only be called a disaster, uh, are still, you know, get, be called on the mainstream media to provide their commentary and their expert opinion and so forth. But you've got this spate of articles showing what a disaster this place is. I mean, it's really no different from when Saddam was, was in charge. You've got a dictatorial regime. They're torturing people. They're killing people. It's death and destruction and violence. And let's not forget, in, in, in consistent with your earlier point, that the U.S. supported Saddam Hussein. It was once partners with him when they were helping him kill Iranians. And then ultimately yeah. they turn on him, and it's like your scorecard thing. How do you keep track of the friends and the enemies at any particular time? Well, the ultimate irony, irony too, is that Obama, Barack Obama, who built his national career on, uh, even though he wasn't in the Senate at the time, at having opposed the war in Iraq, has been giving speeches about all the good that's come out of our, our, our inter intervention in Iraq. And he was before the troops just recently pointing out the good things that came as a result of that. So, you know, that's that's the big joke. I mean, he, he made a career out of it, but who knows if he even meant it. In fact, during the campaign, he said he wasn't even sure that he would have voted against the, uh, the, that war in, uh, if he had been in the Senate. So, so uh, as Bill Clinton said it during that uh, frame campaign in, in 2008, it's one big fairy tale. Yeah, it really is. I mean, they're maintaining this giant lie, and what I like to point out is not one of these neocons, not one, and not one member of Congress 
has dared to take his family on vacation to Iraq since the, the Iraq invasion. Now, if this is as big a paradise as they say it is, uh, why not take your family there? Why not do one of those co famous congressional junkets to Iraq? Well, of course, they, they know that it's just nonsense. And, and we're, we're, uh, we're linking to a lot of these articles in our, in our FFF daily uh, showing that this thing has been a disaster, not just in terms of the number of American troops that were killed and maimed and damaged and all screwed up in the head, but the countless Iraqis that were killed. I mean, remember, none of these people had anything to do with 9-11. None of them. And yet they, they've you know, been you have, you have a couple, couple hundred thousand people killed directly in the war. And then, uh, by some estimates, you know, a million dead as, uh, from, from effects after the war. Yeah, it's, it's, and no officials have been called to account. It's, it's just, uh, it's a crime on a massive scale. And, uh, you know, a moment speechless. I mean, what you can, do people have any appreciation of what, how, you know, how big a crime, uh, that was and, and what misery, uh, has resulted from it? Yeah, and what I, I find fascinating is that the mindset in Washington is the same as that reflect by Madeleine Albright. When 60 Minutes asked her whether the deaths of half a million Iraqi children from the sanctions against Iraq were worth it, she thinks for a moment and says, well, yeah, it's a tough issue, but yeah, they're worth it. And, and that's this cavalier attitude that's been taking place with respect to the Iraq invasion of, oh, yeah, we don't know exactly how many Iraqis were killed, 200,000, a million. We didn't keep track of them. We only kept track of our own. But it doesn't matter because in their minds, any number of Iraqis killed would be worth this regime change. Uh, you know, and then they wonder why people are so angry over this cavalier attitude toward the, the lives of Muslims and, and Arabs and people in the Middle East. Well, and there's another person, Madeleine Albright, who uh, anytime she writes a book, and even if she hasn't written a, a new book, will be interviewed on all the shows and treated like this prestigious elder stateswoman uh, who's, you know, the f uh, fount of wisdom, and call, she's called on to, uh, you know, pronounce on what's going on, who's doing a good job in foreign policy, as if she, you know, she doesn't have that on her record. She was also one, the one who famously uh, asked uh, sarcastically of uh, Colin Powell, uh, what's the point of having all these good weapons and systems and stuff if we never get to use them? This is, this is the mindset, and uh, it's a very bad mindset. We have to, like you say, do our work to uh, counter it. Yeah, it's, it's a horror story, and, and that's, that's what we need to do is raise the consciousness uh, of the American people, and 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 I think that's happening, especially with young people, young libertarians. I mean, they they see this right away that the warfare state is just as damaging, if not more so, than the welfare state. And, hey, but I wanted to talk about uh, Korea. I think this fits in the, in this thing as well. That you know, this big brouhaha is now turned up uh, in 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 Korea, and and it's so funny to watch the mainstream press because as you and I have talked about since we first started this show, you're not going to get the libertarian angle in the mainstream press and they're all talking about how this North Korean erratic leader has has provoked this controversy and provoked this crisis this is nonsense I mean what the US did in conjunction with the South Korean government they go and they get sanctions against this guy in the United Nations they go and have military exercises and they know they know what his reaction is going to be. How do they know? Because this is the reaction of the North Korean regime uh, since since ad infinitum. Whenever they do these things, they get sanctions, they have military exercises, the guy goes ballistic, whether it's him or his father or, or the officials in the North Korean regime. So they knew exactly what they were doing this time around. And so just as, as, as lightning, as thunder follows lightning, this guy goes off the deep end after they do this, and they accuse him of provoking things. And he says, well, he's going to unleash nuclear weapons, and he's going to go after South Korea. Same bombastic stuff the guy's always done. And so now what are they proposing? The, the U.S., the Pentagon's announced a $1 billion anti-missile defense system to defend against some perceived threat from that North Korea is going to attack the United States. I mean, is, does this not say at all with respect to foreign policy, Sheldon? Well, I agree, I agree with you. Uh, of course, this has been going on, what, 60 years. 
Uh, we, the U.S. has uh, thousands of troops near that border as a tripwire, so any, skir- any uh, skirmish or a conflict that breaks out between North and South Korea immediately involves the United States. There's no, basically have no choice in that because Americans are going to be right there. And uh, the, the public probably will be then, uh, you know, thundering for some kind of response if, if an American gets killed. Uh, I don't believe we've ever uh, offered, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to tell the, the North Kore- Koreans that we have no intention of making war on them. In other words, there's never been a gesture that said we have no aggressive or, you know, hostile intentions uh, toward uh, North Korea. If we were to remove those troops... Uh, you know, we would have been out of the way. I seriously doubt whether uh, this uh, newest leader would be, uh, you know, saber rattling or uh, uh, nuke, nuke rattling. Um, and uh, I think this serves the. Uh, I'm not saying it's all cooked up by the U.S. officials, but it certainly serves their interest to keep people on edge, justify spending. Uh, it's. I agree. It's the old story. Well, this is what Madison said about the Roman Empire. There's a great quote by Madison where he said, whenever the the Roman citizens would start to get stirred up about too high taxes and too high regulations uh, from, of course, the welfare warfare state there in Rome, uh, that uh, the public officials would stir up some kind of crisis overseas. And it's not difficult to stir up a crisis. I mean, you can see this Korean thing just stirs up overnight. And, and the Korean leader does exactly what the U.S. officials do. He uses the threat of a U.S. invasion to stir up all his citizens, to rally behind the government and so forth. So, you know, people are starving to death there because of their little socialist system. But, man, he gets people all riled up, rallying to the government. It's the same thing that the U.S. does. Now, all of a sudden, we're supposed to be thinking about the communist threat. You've got the repeat. I mean, at least young people are now getting a sense of what Americans lived under with the the war on communism, the Cold War. Oh, the communists are coming to get us. And my feeling is, Sheldon, those troops shouldn't be there. There's, I don't know, 27,000 U.S. troops. Uh, If this guy wanted to kill Americans which is, of course, what the U.S. officials want to make us believe, seems to me like it'd be a fairly easy thing to unload on 27,000 Americans right there a few miles away from the North Korean border. But my, what I have said, and I'm sure what you've said, what libertarians have said is, those troops shouldn't be there. They should just bring them back, leave the guy alone. It's like that analogy I use of scuba divers. That scuba divers know that there's a lot of dangerous people in the in the ocean. And I forget where I read this analogy, but it's great. That as long as you leave those dangerous creatures alone, they'll leave you alone. And the same thing applies to all these dangerous creatures out here. They ought to just get out of Korea. They should have done it 60 years ago. Leave the guy alone and leave Korea to the Koreans. Yeah, um, just to reinforce a, a very important point you made, when when uh, when the United States puts economic sanctions on a place like Korea, uh, North Korea, it, uh, you hand the leader there a ready excuse for all his, uh, you know, all the problems he's causing, and and you get uh, the it makes it easier for him to win over the people and rally the people against this, you know, external enemy. And which is what we've done, like we've done in so many other places. We're doing it in Iran, we've done it in Cuba, we've done it in other places before. So uh, we make economic warfare, and then we wonder why uh, the, the leader you know, makes noises and sounds aggressive. He may be doing it for home consumption. Uh, the point is, look, he, he must realize, given the state of forces today and policy, U.S. policy as it is, uh, if he were to ever unleash any kind of nuclear warhead uh, against the U.S., you know, he, he would lose his regime. He'd be, he'd be pulverized. And uh, just like the Iraqis, uh, the, uh, the Iranians, sorry, uh, there's no reason to think the guy's suicidal. Uh, so we have to keep this stuff in mind. He's, he's obviously gained something by making these noises. But, um, you know, we should look at the big picture. And it's, it's just another case of, uh, of the U.S., I think, sowing the seeds of, of uh, you know, uh, making enemies by its own policy. And then and then benefiting by responding to the very enemies that it helped to create. Yeah, and, and it, he's not dumb. He saw what happened in Iraq, where the U.S. just invades a country that hasn't attacked the United States in order to get a new regime in. So he can use that and say, well, you know, he calls us part of the, the U.S. calls us part of the axis of evil. They're going to do the same thing here. And, and your point's great, that they blame the sanctions, they use the sanctions to... Uh, 
to say, hey, this is why we're having all this economic misery the way Castro did in Cuba. And it's not his socialist system that's failed. It's the U.S. embargo that has caused all their, their problems. But here again, you have this classic case of U.S. interventionism, sanctions, um, military exercises, stirring up trouble. Now, if this guy's as crazy as they say he is, this is not a guy you want to stir up. I mean, if, if all of a sudden he can just unleash an invasion across South Korea or drop a couple of nuclear bombs across the border, why is this a guy you want to provoke? Seems to me like your wisest course of action is get out of there and let sleeping dogs lie. Let the Koreans work this out. South Korea can adequately defend itself. I mean, it's, it's a prosperous, strong, uh, independent nation. But in any event, that's essentially, to me, a civil war no different from the Vietnam situation. It's no business to the U.S. government. And like you say, with the troops there, there doesn't have to be a declaration of war, no debate by the American people as to whether we should intervene or not. It's a foregone conclusion that those troops are there to serve as sacrificial lambs to guarantee U.S. entry into the war, which, of course, makes the South Korean uh, president even more bombastic because she knows she's got this automatic guarantee. Yeah, that's a very dis dangerous situation. Of course, our friend uh, Doug Bondo has, uh, is something of a specialist on this, has written quite a bit about it uh, over the years, and... Uh, uh, you know, he has been saying the same thing, that, that this treaty ought to end and the U.S. ought to bring the troops home and, uh, and let them, let them all settle it over there and, uh, keep the U.S., uh, you know, you don't, you don't keep poking at a hornet's nest. I mean, and then, and then you shouldn't be surprised after if you do that when the, if the hornets come out and, and uh, you know, try to sting you. Although, like I said, in this case, he, there's no way uh, this 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 28 year old uh, leader is going to attempt to sting the United States because he, he knows he'd lo he'd lose his regime just given the way the policy is today and the and the, and the status of forces. Uh, it would be a suicidal mission. I find it hard to believe he's suicidal. Well, I think with all these disasters, I mean the Afghanistan disaster it, it, it is is there. You've got the Iraq disaster. You've got this. Uh, this crisis now in Korea, you've got all the assassination programs. I, I, I think the upside of this is that there's more and more people than ever that are questioning what's going on because it, it, it doesn't feel right. I mean, this is not what America should be all about. And unfortunately, you're not going to get this perspective in the mainstream press. You're going to get the same old stuff about the U.S. government's just innocently minding its own business and, and it's trying to maintain peace and stability in the world. Well, that's not the case. It's supporting brutal dictators. It's installing brutal dictators as it did uh, in, in, in Afghanistan. It's, it's killing people. People, it's assassinating people. It's just stirring up a lot of trouble. And, and I think that's, that's what's causing Americans, uh, especially the young people, to say, hey, something's not right in this country. And uh, then that's our job, uh, Sheldon, as libertarians, to, to raise the consciousness and the, and the, 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 as to what's going on in, in, in America and the world and the role that the warfare state has played in it. Not to mention the money part. Is, I didn't even mention the money. that Where's the, the Pentagon coming off saying we're going to spend a billion dollars? I thought they were just supposed to be cutting back because of the sequester. I thought they were all saying, oh, this is going to affect the troops and all this. And all of a sudden, overnight, they say, hey, we got $1 billion to spend. Where'd that money come from? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they're, they're saying they're going to divert it from something else. I haven't heard, uh, haven't heard that. Uh, it's true, though. We need to make this message loud and clear. Uh, you know, you can see concern with the, uh, all the publicity that Rand Paul got uh, from his uh, filibuster about the drones. Uh, that has disturbed people, not just in the Republican Party, but even pundits who fear a rise of what they call isolationism. And you know, and I don't know how many times we have to correct this this in, uh, impression or misimpression. I think it's intentional in many cases, but uh, it's not isolationism. It's not interventionism. If you're a free trader, and if you're for uh, American citizens, just private individuals being free to deal with people all over the world, that's not isolationism. But they want to use that term because it has a smear, you know, has smear value. And even people who you would think would be sort of on the anti-war side want to, um, you know, tag uh, Rand Paul and, uh, and others who agree with him uh, with this um, with this label. 
because there's something, you know, it just seems something unenlightened about it. Oh, you're isolationist, and you just want to have be to yourself. Uh, of course, that's not what it means. So we have our work, once again, cut out for us in trying to show that there's a difference between non-interventionism in terms of military uh, policy and um, isolationism. Yeah, I, we want to do the exact opposite, that we want to liberate the private sector to interact with the people of the world so we get rid of all the sanctions and embargoes and visa restrictions and all that stuff, but we want to rein in the warfare state. I mean, look at Switzerland, which I point to often. They are entirely oriented toward national defense, real national defense. They don't have bases overseas, and they don't have uh, uh, interventions and invasions and occupations and assassinations. And, oh, by the way, they don't have all the perpetual crises with Korea and, and the war on terrorism and all that other stuff because they are genuinely oriented toward real national defense. And that's what we libertarians want to do at the same time as unleashing the the private sector who really are the greatest diplomats, the businessmen, the tourists, the cultural groups, and so forth. Anyway, that's the show, Sheldon. We're unfortunately run out of time. Have another great time with you this week. And, uh, Enjoy it. Thank, yeah, thank you for uh, tuning in to the Libertarian Angle, and we'll be back with you next week. So long. <laughs>